Hello and welcome to our latest episode of Path to Power. I'm Matt Cooper. And I'm Ivan Yates. Now we've both been on mini breaks over the summer, doing a little bit of travel. I stayed domestically in Ireland, going around to various parts of the country, South and Midlands. But Ivan, I believe you were in London, taking the mood of the British nation (laughs) after their recent general election. I don't know about that, but uh, as as you know, I had been to Tormachidi and that wasn't a holiday I brought a dozen members of my family. Um, so whatever that was, it wasn't a holiday. I was in Galway, which was hedonistic, and that wasn't a holiday. But I actually spent a week in Pimlico in London uh, in my daughter's apartment and I enjoyed every minute. Did all the touristy things, a day on the bus and the river tours with commentary and, and all that, which I've done, done before. as far as Greenwich. Uh, it, well, well, up and down, yeah. all, all over the Red Route and the you know, the big bus and all that. Uh, went to Kempton races, went to Lingfield races, went to the Charity Shield at Wembley, went to see Mrs. Doubtfire, uh, a show in the West End, which I really enjoy. <laughs> Would you believe it? You'd, you'd love this. So... They, they had seats at the back in the stalls and I said, look, get this. So I went to the supervisor and said, is it okay if I stand by the wall after 20 minutes? Or oh, I'll have to speak to my supervisor. You know, they have layers of supervisors in, in this Shaftesbury Theatre. And so then after 10 minutes, and you know, the show hadn't started, this lady came and said, no, you cannot possibly stand there. But I'll tell you what, there's a box that's empty upstairs. So we got the most expensive dog. Actually looking out over the stage, it was, so I could kneel and it was absolutely, so I'm, I'm playing the old soldier pretty well. But what I, I noticed about London was uh, 12 million people, how clean it was. And the streets were spotless. The buildings were spotless. Like uh, this is in all the city centre areas, the touristy areas. Such a contrast with Dublin. Funny that you used to say that, no, because it makes me think, Dublin, I think, is getting dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. It is. And there are things that can be done. I remember speaking just before the local elections with people from the Dublin Bid, the Business Improvement District, and they brought various councillors in for a debate in advance of the local elections. And one of the things that we discussed was this issue of rubbish in the city centre. One of the problems that they identified was, you know, this, the holy grail of competition when Dublin City Council had its own bin services previously and then it was instead disbanded and subcontracted out to various private operators. The private operators are in competition with each other. They have vans, bins going up and down at various different times. They're bypassing certain rubbish because that's not for Mm -hmm. them to collect. It's for somebody else. But it's a complete mess and you have the bags out that are getting ripped by seagulls Mm -hmm. And what basically is required is a series of large underground bin storages that various restaurants and cafes and various other places can go to on a regular basis and deposit. But there seems to be a fear about putting things like that on the streets in case people who are living in apartments and whatever start using Mm. those instead of actually paying for their own bins to be collected. But I, I can only imagine this weekend, for example, we have a terrific about thirty to 40,000 Americans in town for the college's American football, the Erlingus football, college's football classic. I can only imagine what they're going to make of the filth and the dearth mm. of Dublin. It is extraordinary. Uh, but it, it, uh, what I noticed was different. Not only was there no litter, but actually the streets and the pavements were actually clean. Like you get the sense that nobody really does an effective power wash of our, our footpaths well, and in fairness, so on. They do, but it isn't done off yeah. enough. And a lot of people, unfortunately, are simply dirty. They just mm. aren't uh, motivated to go and put rubbish in bins. They just throw it on the streets. The, the, the couple of lack other, of social conscience. A couple of Ireland. other things I observed from Hyde Park to Ten City is very prevalent in London. I hadn't been there for several years and I was I was actually shocked the extent of, and I said, how long have they been there? And they said, actually, for months. Uh, the other thing is Starmer and his personality, I think, is starting to come through. I remember during the last week of the campaign, he said something which I thought was rather unusual. And he said, I want to make it clear, I will be a Friday 5 p.m. Prime Minister. In other words, the weekend is the weekend. I will work my guts out from Monday to Friday. And I said, ah, yeah, right. We'll see how that one goes. And of course, then with the riots, he's actually taken no holidays. He's been working COBRA committee meetings and cabinet meetings through weekends. Uh, The difference between real life and being in government is quite different. I don't think Simon Harris has taken a holiday, has he? No. Oh, I mean, it's unbelievable. He was like one minute he's 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 with the medal people in Paris. The next minute he's with the Rose of Tril- Roses of Tralee. He's going to be a Ben 
the blog this yeah. Sunday, giving the Michael Collins commemoration Talk, speech. There, there isn't an agricultural show that can be held without him. It is just phenomenal. Uh, and, you know, I was speaking to one of his advisors and I said, you know, politics is a marathon, not a sprint. No, Ivan. The sprint between now and the 15th of November is very much a sprint. Yes, indeed. And 15th of November is a date we'll come back to. But actually, I just want to go back to your theatre experience because I wouldn't have put you down as a man of culture. No, I, I was know. dragged. Yeah, I was and, dragged. And, but it's had and, a good bar. And fairness. I don't know if, if Mrs. <laughs> Doubtfire goes down necessarily as culture either, but <laughs> we're not being snobbish about your theatre choices. Does that mean that you're now inspired that we we're in the Olympia on the 11th of September, the Wednesday night, and when we're in the opera? House in Cork on the 13th, the Friday, that you're now going to dress up as Mrs. Doubtfire. That's well, not going to be your <laughs> shtick on stage. Well, you haven't been inspired in that well, way, I, I hope. It was amazing the number of gear changes and and, and the whole lot that uh, the, the actor did. It was quite incredible. No, I'm looking forward to this. It, it, it's, it's, it's the Wednesday in, in Dublin, the Olympia. Yeah. There are tickets still available. How do people get tickets? Ticket and we have some Master. good guests. Ticketmaster.ie is where people get tickets for the Dublin gig. And then it, the Cork Opera House has its own website for looking after the tickets. And can you impart uh, because the, one of the differences between the regular show and the live shows is we will not just be uh, talking dementedly to each other in a square box. We'll be actually <laughs> talking to other people as well. We will, but we'll keep the identity of our guests secret for a little while, maybe and reveal nearer the date. But we have guests. A-listers. A-listers, political A-listers in Cork and in Dublin who will be joining us. So what we'll do is we will have discussions relevant to the local audiences uh, particularly I'm looking forward to on the day of the Dublin event will be the Trump-Harris debate would have been overnight and that will give us an opportunity to dissect that and how that's likely to impact on the American elections on the 5th of November, which of course I am going to miss not being over there because I think at this stage both you and I believe November 15th is the date Yeah, I, I, for I would, our general I, I would I would nail it down to three dates. The first, 8th or 15th. Not the 8th. I've, how many times do I, I know have that. to explain I know to that. you that the 8th does not make sense? Well, put it like this. I'm looking at the doll. Be- so the budget is set in stone the 1st of October. That's a Tuesday. I think the Thursday of the following week is the most likely day of dissolution. And if you do the maths for the 21 or 28 day campaign, but someone said to me an absolute certainty uh, in government that the election will be held before the 15th of November. Just to say, I was checking back. So my life has been turned upside down because we're both busy people in our own lives. But in a moment of weakness, and it was weakness. Patricia Monaghan, before she left to go to RTE. This is the former managing editor of News Talk. Said, Ivan, would you ever do calling it again for 43 constituencies, about 550 candidates have to be digested with Sean Defoe, the Bauer political correspondent. Did she not learn her lesson from the last time when you got it all wrong? <laughs> well, no, I'll put it like this. Everyone else uh, found it really <laughs> insightful when you go through, this is the Sock Dem and this is the geography and this is the difference between Burr and Tullamore and all that kind of thing. So it actually Actually, and, and also the other thing is that, so you have a five-seater. The key thing is to nail down who are the seven out of the five, who are the five out in a three-seater that it's between. And it can be variables. And you'll get the odd banana skin and so on. But but basically, uh, a couple of things. So I've started this work. Like once you wave enough money at me, I will, I will, I will <laughs> relent. And so I, I'm going to do 43 uh, calling it constituencies. And I... I've just started on the work in it and it is like I'm I'm literally groaning under it because the number of conversations, because unlike the last election, candidates were selected a year in advance because people were waiting for the local and the Euros and the fallout. The conventions are actually, uh, Fine Gael have done about a half of them uh, of the 43, they've done about 20. Fianna Fáil perhaps less so. So Sinn oh, Féin have started as well. That's right. And I think everybody is now aiming to have them done by the end of September. September. And the word is as well is that now some candidates who've been confirmed have been told to get the posters sorted yep. out as well. And the posters is something they have to do in coordination with party headquarters because there has to be a consistency in imaging and all the rest of it. So I think even at this stage, the opposition parties is with are on red alert. They have to be ready. But the selection of November. conventions only tells you out the story. Where headquarters uh, yeah. is not satisfied with the convention, what it's going to procure, 
they reserve the right to select less at the convention and add candidates. And reading the mind of headquarters, because they're saying to people, because they want to keep people on side, they don't want them to go leave the party and to go as an independence. They kind of say, we're thinking about you. You're, you're on our prayers and on our thoughts. So actually to get genuine information on the runners and riders, and you could have someone who's just a late entry decides to go, but my, my overall sense of this election is one of the 174 TDs, there'll be 70 new TDs. That's that's number one. With Sorry, retirement. 70. 70. Okay. Uh, 40%. Uh, the, the, second, the second thing is, I'm not detecting, like even people who are going to vote Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and candidates are going to get elected. It's more the devil you know than you don't know, than real excitement or, you know, a sense of momentum like Labour had in Britain. Uh, the, 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 and the second, so therefore it's damage limitation for Harris. It's Fianna Fáil. Can they get 40 to 45 seats? The Sinn Féin thing is really interesting. So could I just, before you get to the Sinn Féin thing, I'm interested though in you say that it could be 40% of the next oil could be new candidates. What would that actually do to political decision making in the Doyle? There'd be an awful lot of people trying to make a name for themselves, trying to get a bit yeah. of attention on themselves. But what would what it would do for consistency? Well, it's new it's blood. It's new or blood. Does it really matter? Because in a sense, the decisions are made by government and are made with the civil servants. One of the things that I was, when I was, so my, my starting point is always to digest what happened in 2020 and then look at the redraw and work. One of the things that, interestingly, because Tim Ryan's, you know, Ted Nealon book of politics is the encyclopedia for all this. The doll was dissolved. Leo went to the park on the 14th of January 2020. Micheál Martin was elected Taoiseach on the 14th of June, a six-month stretch. And in the middle of that was COVID. And, and sorry, one of the reasons they had to actually get on with it because they couldn't pass legislation because the Senate couldn't be formed because the Taoiseach's 11 had to be appointed. So the point is this, that even though we may have a result in mid-November, we mightn't have a government till Patrick's Day. Oh, I, that's certainly what I was... And I've said that to you before, that you know people have been saying that Simon Harris wants to stay until March to make sure that he gets to go to Washington as our Taoiseach, that he'd be at least guaranteed one shot of that. It is possible that he could go as interim Taoiseach next March because they still will not have found a way to cobble together a new government, depending on the figures. But part of that, I suppose, comes back to Sinn Féin because a year ago, the consensus had developed that Sinn Féin was going to lead the next government. Well, the government. polls, the polls indicated that. Yeah, yeah, so much as you believe the polls. Okay. And actually that's something that we're going to make a big part of our Dublin event at the Olympia yeah. as well, about the whole much attention we should pay to polls. But leaving that aside for okay. now, the Sinn Féin position, um, it, the, the party has been in somewhat in flux over the last number of months, this year, I suppose, running up to the local and European elections and now trying to respond. And you see the likes of Owner Brain is very much trying to push the housing message mm -hmm. again. And even this week, I see Pierce Doherty was very angry in relation to the government's decision not to pursue certain land hoarders on the land hoarding tax. And we might get to that yeah, in a little will. while. But uh, Sinn Féin is trying to reposition itself. So what's your sense at this stage? Is it that... Will it hold all of the seats that it won in the last election? How many more will it win to put itself back into a position of being able to be in the next government with Mary Lou Macdonald okay. as Taoiseach? So you, you are on the radio every day. You're one of the most informed journalists who have to read and study everything. I, I dip in and out of it. I'm going to give you a little quiz now, OK? Who is Sorka Clark? She's a TD from Longford, is it? OK. Who is Claire Kiernan? Claire Karen. 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 Um, I think she is from the west of Ireland in one of the constituencies, would I be correct? Okay, now, because I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Sock Dems and I'm looking at... Sorry, is that Kiran? Uh, okay, I take any... Yes, it could be Kiran. Yeah. Uh, who is Rhea de Cronin? Rhea de Cronin is in Kildare. Yeah. And uh, I, she would be somebody who was once involved with Fianna Fáil back around the turn of the century, would have had a big issue in relation to planning for a house where Charlie McCreevy would have helped her out. But uh, such is her gratitude that she ended up moving to Sinn Féin in Kildare. And she used to be quite active on social media until she became elected okay. as a TD. Who's Liam Quaid? Liam Quaid now is one that I'm struggling to remember okay. who he is. Patricia Ryan, did we talk about her? No. Okay. Uh, I can think Eugene Long? I could think Eugene Patricia Long. Ryan, he used to be in Fianna Fáil. Okay, Eugene, think... Eugene Long? 
a silent TD or a candidate? Do not. Well, I'm, I'm trying. I'm 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 because I think some of these will be TDs. I was Martin Brown. Oh, he's done a Temporary, okay. and he would be. Um, he would be the sort of the Sinn Féin equivalent of Matty McGraw, wouldn't okay. he? Okay, well, Wait, sorry. I'd actually he, sorry. give you nine out of ten. Okay. Because I, I actually was going through to answer your question of the 37 TDs elected for Sinn Féin. And you, I'm giving you nine out of ten because yeah. you actually knew them. I wrote down a list of people that I think the public don't know. Uh, Martin Brown, Pat Buckley, Sorka Clark, uh, Rhea de Cronin, John E. Gurk, uh, he's the, isn't he the guy down in Wexford? No, or Johnny no, Mythen is the guy in Wexford. Wexford. He's uh, the guy that had the tiny vote in the local elections who romped home in the general election. Uh, Claire Curran, Denise yes. Mitchell, uh, Patricia yes. Ryan, uh, Pauline Tully and Johnny Mythen. Well, Ma- sorry, Pauline Tully would be very well known in Cavan Monaghan yes, and correct. she will regain her okay. seat. So, so, so what, 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 what I'm saying to you is this. One of the, th- the the feedbacks I got in the local elections was that people who got 12, 18,000 votes had sort of been part of the disappeared since in terms of they just were not visible in the doll. They weren't visible in terms of of the constituency. And Sorry, that pe- you do know there's apparently a um, pecking order inside an office accommodation as well inside in Leinster House and surrounding buildings in that some of the people that you've mentioned who would be regarded as poorer performers, if not quite disappeared to the dungeons, have been put in the outer reaches of the accommodation. But, but this will come available. against the party when it comes to but getting I, I, these people re-elected. See, but I think that there may be a feeling within Sinn Féin, rightly or wrongly, that these people were not elected because of who they were. They were elected simply because the Sinn Féin brand but to name... Be re-elected, are, to be re-elected, to be re-elected. But, re- but because what I, what they I still think, get swept along in the Sinn Féin brand name. Well, you see, well, you see what, what I'm talking about here is if there's no national zeitgeist for any party, even for independence, right? Um, and I, I could give you a, a classic example of you take Tipperary now. In Tipperary North, I honestly believe the, the Michael Lowry, Jackie Cal, and uh, Alan Kelly would get elected. People tell me in South Tipperary that Michael Murphy, Councillor Michael Murphy from uh, uh, Fina Gale, will get elected in the Clonmel area, that Matty McGrath will get elected, and that unbelievably uh, Seamus Healy. Uh, the, 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 the veteran uh, left-wing candidate yeah. independent will get elected. Now, I've got that from Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil and so on. So here so you have... no Sinn Féin TD in Tipperary? No, well, Martin Brown is in the hunt with Healy for the last seat, right? Okay. The point I'm trying to make here is within the one premier county, you have a situation that Lowry has cannibalised the Fine Gael vote and there'll be no Fine Gael TD mm. in North Tipperary. Matty McGrath has cannibalised the Fianna Fáil vote in South Tipperary and there'll be no Fianna Fáil TD elected. Uh, and, and, and so, so therefore... Jackie Cahill, South or North? No, he's, he's North. Uh, he's, yes, he's North. He's okay. North. He's North. So the, the, the situation here is within the one county, what you have is individuals who will make it their business because of one factor, the ground war. This, I think, is a general election where the foot soldier is going to be rewarded, plus the recency bias of the council elections. In other words, oh sure, that fella called to my house three times in the last year for the local elections, and his team did, and that recency bias. So what, what I'm trying to say is this, that even where... Uh, the headquarters of Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael are devising national campaigns. The truth of it is, they will go through the, the 43 constituents and say, we're, we're sound here, we're not sound here. And it's all to do with the candidates. Talking about candidates. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Like a national election is going to turn into a 43 local election. Uh, isn't it always? No, no. The last election, Sinn Féin, uh, went from, 40, from 9% yeah, okay, to point. 25%. That was a national swing. Yeah, it was that, nothing to do with locals. And it was people voting for Mary Lou Macdonald by yeah. proxy and you wonder will they want to do the same again. But hang on, something else, it's celebrity candidates yeah. I want to talk to you about. Yeah. And there was you on the lash down in the Galway races and you didn't pick up and come back to me with the news about Grania Shoiga. Yes. How did you miss that one? I, I, and you know what? Grania Shoiga was emceeing with Brian Leeson for the first time they did a ball on the Saturday night towards after I'd left Galway in, in, in the G Hotel and like this was advertised every week and she was MC for it and she was high profile and all the rest of it. I spoke to Fianna Fáil people, Alan Cheevers, uh, the John Connollys of this world, the Ollie Crows of this world, and people gave me the 
the, the inner gizzards of Eamon Keeve's departure and so on. And not and nobody only, said to you, no, and, 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 and not only this, I this I think this is 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 a stroke that Sean Dorgan is going to pull. And I want to talk about Dahi O'Shea as well. In insofar as that Gronya Shoiga uh it, it, it is is a very credible candidate because she's done both news anchor and she's done up for the match and talent shows and get up the art. But the Cynthia Nivaraku success actually like, it was unbelievable. Here's someone that had gone out of the public consciousness for 25 years. She's she's a barrister, little known. She turns up in Carlo, the edge of the South constituency, and she romps home to a seat. This 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 tells Fianna Fáil headquarters if we can get people of name name recognition that they are electable. Geez, so are they asking you back? No, 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 <laughs> no, no. Sorry, sorry I'm I'm aging. They're, uh, they're so, not that desperate. So the the Dahi the Dahi the Dahi one. Is well, hold really, on a second, just on the Grainne oh, Shoiga yeah. one, which I'm interested in because. Um, she will probably pick up votes, particularly she's from Spittle. Yeah. She's living back in Galway, I think it is. Yeah. And her uh, sister Sheila is very visible in yeah. the, she does podcasts from there so and so she, on. She possibly Both Gael Gores. Yeah. No, Eamon O'Keefe is not apparently endorsing anyone. No. He's standing back, keeping yeah. out of it. But there would be this perception that she will pick up the sort of the West of Ireland vote. The constituency runs from the city up via the Gwail up as far as taking in parts of Yeah, goes South out to Arran well. Moor on the west side. But how will the rest of Fianna Fáil Clifton. take to this imposition? Because, you know, it's one thing in um, European election where the party is told around a large constituency to get behind Cynthia yeah. Nguyen. Or Fine Gael got behind Nina Carberry, yeah, yeah. another celebrity winner um, who said very little during the campaign, had done no groundwork as yeah. such in advance, um, but had been the winner of Dancing at the Stars and gets forward. But when you get to a local constituency where you had people who had ambitions and who've done the groundwork and served yeah. in councils, do they necessarily pitch in behind the putting in a celebrity candidate? Because I can think of another Gael Gore who was once, and this is showing my age yeah. a bit. Do you remember Liam O'Muraku, the late yes. Liam O'Muraku, Tromo yes. In Cork, was it? He, went, he ran in Cork North Central and was expected to come in as a winner. Lost Mm. Utterly, right? Mm. I think it was in a by-election. Yeah. This is going back to the early 1980s or late 1970s. But the point is, celebrity candidates in elections, general elections, do not always work. No, and and but 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 put it like this: if 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 she doesn't come through a convention, which I think is 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 possible that she won't, uh, Fianna Fáil have to meet the 40% quota of women. Yes. And, and and therefore, they will argue that. So what they could do is select one or two at convention and add her. But the fact that, that she's been out there canvassing makes her more addable, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and of course, this is a real problem for a lot of the parties. And they have to have 40% of their candidates being women. Or you lose half you, your money. Or lose half your state funding. So that is a powerful incentive oh, to actually... Like it was 30%. No, so, so let's move on because Dahi O'Shea is very definitely not a woman. Absolutely. <laughs> right, so... So Dahi, Dahi, Dahi uh, ticks a lot of boxes. First of all, Finn and Gale are in trouble in this constituency with Brendan so Griffin stepping Kerry, down. Hang on, you know Dahi doesn't live in Kerry anymore. I know, I he know lives he's in like, Dublin 4. Yeah. No, he doesn't. He no, lives no. in Balls Bridge. No. In Sandy Mount. No. I know exactly where he lives. He doesn't. I, I will put it like he, this. I, when I lived in Sandy Mount, he was actually one of my neighbours. Dahi lives down in the west, down in Galway. He drives. Oh, does he? Okay. Yeah. Well, put it like this. I... I, I, I just find out where his child is going to school. But anyway, that Down in Galway. <laughs> I said, okay, I tell, no, no, okay. I, I can tell you that. Because okay, well, I, I, we had, I had this Back in 2012, Sorry, he I, lived I, in Dublin. Oh, that's a long time yeah, ago. Yeah. I had pints with Dahi in Cork last year. I had a night out in the pub with Dahi. Yeah. And uh, he was telling me all about this stuff. Dahi is a great character. Yes. I'm very, very, very fond of Dahi. But I wasn't aware of him having political ambitions. Well... First of all, it's not established that he has political ambitions, but number one... No, he's just been the cute Kerryman who's refused to rule it out when he was asked if he would follow in the footsteps of Grania Shoiga, who I think may have co-presented that programme yeah, with him. The talent the, show. The, the, or he was the Today Show on RT television, or maybe she well, was know, the predecessor. Maura Duran. Uh, Maura Duran yeah, is no, on now and, with and, him doing okay. it, yes. So, uh, the boxes he ticks is that, that uh, he is from West Kerry and would uh, have grown up in Dingle, He's 48 uh, and he has all the 
uh, name recognition uh, boxes. He has the likability, the sort of dancing with the, the stars thing that Nina had. He has all of that and perhaps a bit of substance of current affairs to go with it. Uh, so Norma Foley is already selected in Tralee, mm. education minister and so on. So I think it's a perfect balance right in the Healy Ray rump of South Kerry, you know, from your Ken Mayers right through to your Killarneys and so on, to put this Exocet missile into him. I'm not saying it'd be selected, but Fianna Fáil, in my view, don't have, because they've had their convention there, they don't have a ready-made council Sorry. candidate okay. that would get the name recognition across the entire county of Kerry, which is a huge area. See, I'm, I have my doubts about that. And, you know, it could be that Dahi has a plan to go into politics that he sees it as his next career move. But I think he would be reluctant to put himself forward for convention because where would that leave his career with RTE? Now, I know the Today Show is not a political programme sure. that he does in the afternoon. And just to care and interest, my wife is a regular contributor uh, on, to that programme. Yeah. And I'm going to be doing a little bit with it as well in okay. the autumn as it happens. So just putting that out there. But anyway, um, he if he does that, does that impact on his ability to be able to present the programme? You know, if he stands for... No, he'll either be selected loses. or he... You see, the convention is over. So right. either Hay oh, so is going to add him or not. But if once he's added, does he then, like, have to do a Niall Boylan and step aside oh. from his TV show? I mean... That's, or, or George Lee. That's George Lee income. was in that situation, you yeah. know. Uh, well, he, and he, he, and you, you can see, get Do back within a certain time. See, I think Do, 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 he's a contractor, not a staffer. He's a contractor, but I think he's a damn good broadcaster. Yeah, he's really, yeah. really good at what he does. And, yeah. you know, if he becomes a politician, maybe he's had enough of the Rose of Tralee. He's done it for over a decade now. He's arguably the best presenter the Rose of Tralee has ever had. Yeah. Well, Gay Byrne was outstanding. No, I think Dolly is better. I think yeah. Dolly is yeah, better. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Gay Byrne had a certain particular style, not taking anything away yeah. from his brilliance as a broadcaster. But I think Dolly had that natural Kerry thing and it was well over. So you're, miss, you're missing, uh, you're, you're, you're airbrushing the co hosting arrangement. I'm sorry, Catherine <laughs> Thomas has been there for the last two years. But I think. She, she's in irrelevancy, is no, she? No, <laughs> I wouldn't say that at all. Far from it. Jesus, far from me to say something like that. That's your word that you use. So I just. Sorry, uh, Catherine, if you're listening in case yeah, you think uh, that. Catherine is but, great crack, but actually. She is great fun. You're not going to suggest her for a constituency, no, you know, no. for a party, are no, you? No, she's in Carlo, isn't she? <laughs> uh, so that's completely... Jennifer Murnane is there. Well, but, but in, it's fair, like this. in fairness, Catherine lives in Dublin now no, yeah, well. but, yeah, what I'm, what I'm saying, uh, surmising about... I'm not saying Dahi's going to be a candidate, but I'm saying if he is a candidate, I could see him getting elected. We need to take a break and we'll be back with more in this edition of Path to Power after this. Welcome back to Path to Power. So, we're continuing with our roundup of what's going on. And of course, we're going to be in the Olympia Theatre on the 11th of September, the Wednesday night, after the debate overnight in the United States between Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, the two candidates to win the presidency of the US. And this week, we're recording this on Thursday in advance of Kamala Harris's speech to the Democratic Convention in Chicago. But it has been an extraordinary week of politics up to now, Ivan. I don't know how much of it you have been watching, but between Joe Biden's farewell speech, in a sense, and the love shown from in the auditorium and the Democrats coming together, and then various performances by the likes of Bill Clinton during the week, Tim Walz, the vice presidential nominee, who looks like may have been a brilliant choice, not your sort of establishment political figure, but somebody who can really appeal to middle America as one of them, as somebody who has done good and who makes J.D. Vance look like a privileged pup by comparison. What have you been making of the way the Democrats suddenly seem to have their energy back and how Kamala Harris may be surfing a wave, not of policy, because who listens to policy, but just that vibe of positivity, whereas Trump is just wallowing in his own negativity. Well, uh, it's it's been a few weeks since we actually discussed the US presidential election between one thing and another. And there's no doubt it is it is turned around remarkably from the assassination attempt on Trump. Uh, the polls, even in swing states, would 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 have you believe that it's it's now almost Kamala Harris's to lose. 
uh, Tim Walls. I thought Josh Shapiro would get the vice president thing, but apparently he wanted to be president, whereas Tim Walls doesn't want to be president. He's happy to be number two. And that's very important for a vice presidential nominee as as far as the presidential nominee is. So whatever unity momentum boost that Trump got out of the previous uh, uh, shindig uh, for the the GOP, there is no doubt uh, from Oprah right across uh, two things came across from the NDC in Chicago. One was unity. It was coronation. There was no dissent at all. Um, But uh, so my, my overview of it is, look, first of all, we have our traditional predictable culture war election. Uh, on, on the red corner, you have low tax, less government, uh, and therefore all the things like the 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 forty four percent CGT capital gains tax, the twenty eight percent CPT well, sorry, versus fifteen percent. Sorry, this is what Kamala Harris is proposing. At present, U.S. corporation tax rates are twenty one percent. By bringing them, down and Trump to, bought them down yeah, to twenty one. And the belief was that then a lot of American businesses would repatriate profits or wouldn't offshore them in places like Ireland. She's talking of going to 28%, which actually for Ireland would be manna from heaven. Yeah. If American companies saw that, they would, wherever they make their money overseas, they would keep it there instead of repatriating yeah. it. We would get the tax instead. Whereas Trump is promising 15. Which and could it's be even, a major problem. Uh, seriously. So that's the first point of difference. We'll just take tax and spend is the first battleground. The second one then is evangelical Christian uh, and uh, versus... Uh, absolute feminist rights and and actually moving that 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 whole thing forward uh, you probably have a bit uh, so you pro business pro worker you actually have also perhaps less regulation fracking would be an issue and so on so all those i i just put down as traditional uh, predictable culture war politics okay and red and blue okay so what's what's different here is first of all um if kamala maintains her progress, she has actually become become the focus of it. And I want to ask you, because I, I've, I've dipped into this in social media, just an observer, right? And I'm going to ask you to, 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 so the cackle and the laugh is, is, is sort of just become viral. And that's actually, I think, a positive for her. It's positive with the younger generation and so on. Does she take a drink? Oh, yeah. I actually have a friend <laughs> who's been on the piss with her. Yeah. Right. And now this is going back 25 years ago in San Francisco. And I know he'll be listening. Right. And I say he's now chuckling away as he listens to this podcast. So I won't identify him. But he was in San Francisco about 25 years ago as part of a tech thing. And they met with Kamala Harris, who was a rising political star at the time in California. And they ended up drinking in a bar in San Francisco to the small hours of the morning. And he was entranced by her. He said she was the fun. She was the crack. Mm. Right. So she is a woman. So has she has she ever has she ever made a speech while intoxicated? I have no idea. Okay, and I'm not expecting you to say that. But put it like this: I think it's going to be a dirty, dirty dogfight. The better she does in the polls, and I think that's that's going to become an issue, and it may be a non-issue. Sorry, but there's a couple of things here. Now you just you can come back with your other points okay, in a second. Yeah. But you I say about her laugh and her cackle. Have you ever heard Donald Trump laugh? No, no, no. no the narcissist doesn't laugh. He sort of grins sarcastically and grimaces and throws mm. weird body shapes. Weird been the word yeah, yeah. that is now his very much been applied thing, yeah, and, yeah. and his dancing and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. This is a man who doesn't laugh and he starts criticising. You know, he's a very strange sense of humour and the rest of it. The other thing that was really noticeable from the early days of the the convention and you wonder whether going down into the dirt is the right thing to do. But... Basically, the video that was shown at the start of the convention, Trump is a criminal Mm. and Kamala Harris is a prosecutor. Mm. This is the law and order woman as against the convicted felon, 34 convictions, and he's running to be president of the United States. And while Trump has this cult following, and it is a cult, there are are a bunch of cultists who are following him, right? That is about 40 to 45 percent of the vote. Sizable. It's not 51, is your point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And there's a lot of their people, I think, you know, they get dismissed by this new cult as Republicans in yeah. name only, the rhinos. But there's enough people, I think, floating who find Trump to be utterly 
distasteful. Okay. And just the tactics that he used against Hillary Clinton in 2016 may not work for him in yeah, 2024. Yeah, I, I, get, I get all that. Okay, just want to ask you a question because someone who I trust said to me, this is nothing to do with votes or polls. The Electoral College, 570, 380, magic figure. That you could have a situation, unbelievable, whereby... A state, a state is won and all the delegates must go this, yeah. that members of the Electoral College may defy that and say, Trump won 30% in this state, I'm going to vote for Trump in the Electoral Is that actually technically, because I'm told the penalties... it's possible. Right. But it's, I can't, I don't know. If it's Someone said it to me, happened. in all seriousness, he said, watch out for this after the election. The other thing they said to me... Sorry, that was been said before the last election okay. as well. And in fact, that's what Trump tried to, in, in when Trump tried to provoke the, the insurrection of January 6, 2020... You know, sort of that Mike Pence would not verify. No, I'm not the justifying system. it. I'm just someone's no, mentioning. No. So the other point that someone said to me: if Kamala wants to win, if she really wants to win, the way she, she really could no, no, the way she could win by a landslide is come first week of October. Joe gets unwell, and Joe <laughs> has to step down, and that she is actually made president, and Tim Walz is made vice president during the campaign. And that that would actually give her such, because a lot of people don't know Kamala Harris. You know, I've seen so many Vox Pops done and it's Trump and who's he against? You know, they knew Biden, but they don't know. Her. Now, that sounds remarkable to us, even across the Atlantic. But put it like this. Jesus, if I, you're I, desperate never, to, I never put you down as a conspiracy theorist. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not sorry. This is all to play for. I'm, I'm just saying, I actually, when someone said it to me, if they really want to stop Trump, that's the best way to do it. Well, what's your reaction to that? I think a lot will depend on what happens. Because he in, could get sick. We, well, a lot depends on what happens in the debate on the 10th of September. We'll know an awful lot more about, you know, whether that will be an incredibly highly watched debate, I suspect. It remains to be seen how Trump actually behaves himself on the night. Yeah. Whether Harris will do well when she's not working off auto cue and actually has to get involved in a debate against somebody who is as unpredictable as Donald Trump. So then after that, assessments will have to be made by the Kamala Harris camp as to what is to be done. But you can see how win. it might make sense. Well, I'll tell you, I'll go back a little bit. And there's another conspiracy theory, which... I don't think that's a conspiracy. I just think it's a good campaign tactic. Well, let me talk to you about another good campaign tactic. And a lot of people wondered why we had the initial... Joe Biden, Donald Trump debate so early on in the campaign. Yeah. It was utterly unprecedented. Who persuaded Biden to actually go for that? Because there was a theory that, and this was even floated before the debate, that this was been done so that if Biden performed badly, yeah. that then they would have the impetus to push him out. Biden didn't just perform badly in that debate. He performed disastrously. I mean, the difference between the Joe Biden who gave the speech in Chicago on Monday evening and the Joe Biden who performed in that debate, it was immense. In, you know, the Joe Biden who performed on Monday evening, you could have conceivably oh, But that's a set seen, piece thing. Well, I know. I mean, and that's reading the teleprompter is a lot easier than debating in armed combat well, on it, a TV it, studio. It is. I, I agree entirely with that. But the point I'm coming to is, was were there people within the Democrats who persuaded him to go and got their same grant. He's now been exposed. Yeah. We can now push him out. Well, it was the turning point. There's no doubt. Like it, it's actually very good strategy because we had said from the get go it was game over for for Biden. But but put it like this: I I actually think it would be a stroke of genius for him to you know have have some health condition and an emergency situation, and she is pole vaulted as president. I tell you why I think that's unlikely, right? Because I think Joe, Joe could Bi be left in the bedroom upstairs like we wouldn't put him in jail out like, you know. Well, you see, I think Joe Biden's ego is such. I mean, he's taken a massive significant hit to his ego by agreeing not to run again. But his legacy will depend on her election. Yeah, but you know, this if, if if his legacy is a Trump re-election 
I don't think that reads well for him. I think, like, I think I, I could th- persuade him. You know? Do you? <laughs> if only, if In only the national you've, interest. If only you fly, or do you want to take, uh, <laughs> do you want to take a boat across yeah. the Atlantic no, no, no. to go and have a chat? No, no, but the, the I board, know you offer advisory services <laughs> to Irish <laughs> political parties now, <laughs> yeah. but it might be stretching it to go to no, Joe well, Biden well, well, advising well, well, what him what to I'm take saying a bottle of whiskey if I look around, If I look around at what could happen between now and the 5th of, of November, bearing in mind that Labour Day, the 1st of October, is D-Day for most Americans to make up their mind and they haven't made up their mind, the fact of the matter is that would be a game changer. Yeah, I think the one thing we should know from everything that's happened this year is that there can be no safe predictions made as to who's going to win that presidential election. If it had been in the week after Trump was shot, Trump would have romped home. If it had been in the week after Biden announced he was stepping down and Kamala Harris was replacing him, I think Kamala Harris would have yeah. romped the Trump, The Trump campaign is discombobulated. You can see that they're, they're, they're... He's discombobulated. Yeah, no, well, but we'll put it like this. He's weird. I always believe a candidate is dependent on their campaign managers to a great extent because... Not Trump. Yeah, you know, maybe not. Have you maybe not been not. reading all the books for the last decade yeah, about yeah. Trump? Trump is a dictator. He's not just a dictator in what he wants no. to do with the country. He's a dictator within his own entourage. They all bow down and scrape to the the great narcissist. Okay, just coming home for a second. So we did a thing on our own presidency, and a fella texted me, said, "Ivan, you missed the trick. Really, you missed the trick." And he said, "I'm surprised Matt missed it." And I said, "What's that?" Fianna Fáil could select Charlotte Burns. You were no. you you were you were you sort of espousing what a great president he was, the GAA, uh, the Northern All Island thing. Someone said to me, Don't rule out that at that point in time in November twenty five, his presidency will be coming nearing an end and that Fianna Fáil might select him. I'll tell you why I so didn't I'm bring only it up passing this on. No, I'm I can understand what the person said, but there was a particular reason why I didn't bring that up. I think He's only one year into his presidency. Of three years. Year, of three yeah, years. Yeah. And I think Charlotte Burns, who is a very impressive individual, made great speeches. You think he wouldn't swap common Luke Oscale for the Auris? No, not at all. Uh, in a heartbeat. No, Matt, sorry, in a heartbeat. No, no. Sorry. And I'd explain. If you just, if you just <laughs> listen for a minute or two, the first time I heard of Charlotte Burns as a possible president of the country goes back about four years ago, right? And if things had happened as they should have happened four years ago, he would now be the person, I think, in pole position to be the next president. But what happened was he got beaten to the GAA presidency by Larry McCarthy. Larry McCarthy is a Cork man. He would have had an involvement with my own uh, club growing up, Bishopstown in Cork. Uh, he was, though, probably more involved in soccer and other things, but he mm. emigrated to New York and became very involved in the GAA in New York. And Larry McCarthy surprised everybody when he beat Charlotte Burns to the presidency in the vote back in 2020, before COVID. And he he won the vote possibly because there was a feeling a lot of the overseas vote and stuff and I think give them a turn. And Larry McCarthy was not a dynamic president of the GA, shall we put it. Okay. Okay. Um, And he didn't handle issues such as the television rights and things brilliantly. And he ended up being an almost silent president. By contrast, Charlotte Burns, who has come forward, is an outstanding president. He's very articulate. Exceptionally articulate, but also he talks particularly well in relation to the future of the GA, what it needs to do in relation to its involvement in the community. He has been outstanding as well in his previous role as a school principal in Armagh in relation to bringing the Orange Order into the school to talk with pupils, a a genuine outreach. When I was first made aware of potential political ambitions for him, it would have been in the context of Sinn Féin, mm-hmm. right? And I think Sinn Féin rather than Fianna Fáil would probably have looked to try and have him as a candidate. I think Charlotte Burns has been very careful not to be associated with any party, with any political okay. party. I think he's, his view is that but, it's but, the GA. What about my, the question my, of life after Comet Lucas Hale, President? I, I agree. See, I think... And this is the point I made. If it had happened that he had now was finished the presidency, yeah. if he'd had the presidency finished, I think he would be the perfect candidate. But I think it would the be... The timing. The timing is the problem for him because he is only one year. He's got All-Ireland finals uh, coming up in 2025 and 2026. He can't abandon the GA for but it's like Joe Biden and the, and the heart condition. You know what I mean? Like this is it, different. It, no politics this is, is about di- expediency. But sorry, you know, this, I, I this told you the, the two the two golden rules of politics: put your finger in the air. What do voters want? Give it to them. And the second thing is 
all bets are off if you can win. One other thing before we finish. Oh, so I have today. one other thing that well, I want well, to talk you, about. You go your oh, one okay, other well, thing the first. one other thing is there has been a spat this week about the RZLT. The Sorry, resident- that's my one other oh, thing. That, yes, okay, we're both okay, on the same okay, page. Okay. Right. You, you go first. No, well, I mean, I'm fascinated by this because this is a play towards the farmers. The belief that a lot of this, resi- this zoned land, which has not been built on, the implication being that it has been hoarded, is being farmed upon. And it's unfair on the poor farmers that they would have a tax of 3% of the value of the land, which they intend to continue farming rather than turning into housing. Fully understand that. Fully, it would be unfair to the farmers okay. if they hadn't already applied to have the land rezoned themselves. Now, maybe if the land was rezoned without them actually which asking for it. Which is often the case, yeah. Which is often the case. Then I would have sympathy for them, particularly when we have plenty of other land which had been zoned, which has been dezoned, which could be very much used because it is serviced and the rest of it. If the state really wants that land from the farmers, then why not go for compulsory acquisition, pay them a fair price and then go ahead and build on it? Well, first of all, uh, so what you have on one side is uh, Jack Chambers and Simon Harris saying, oh, over our dead body, will farmers who never wanted their land zone have to pay this 3% tax for simply owning their farmyard and milking their cows? And it's outrageous. I actually think they've missed the point here. This tax was promulgated about three years ago, right? And it is the most ridiculous tax that has ever been put in place for this reason. Hardly. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. This notion that developers are hoarding land is actually, the facts don't stand up. They did a survey of all potential land that was owned. And you know what they found? 11 out of the 12 owners of the land were, guess who? State organisations. The Defence Forces, CIE, HSE, Department of Education. They owned these campuses. They owned these sites. They were actually the land hoarders and they're exempt from the tax. If you go and talk to Stephen Garvey of Glenvey, talk to Michael Stanley of Cairn Homes, who would have the biggest land banks as the tier one developers trying to build 3,000 houses a year. The only reason they ever buy land is to actually build on it. The whole concept. Someone, I said, I couldn't get my head around development 10 years ago and I met this guy. He said, very simple. He said, take one hand and that's the land. You put something on top of it and you put something on top of it and then you sell the whole lot. That is what development is about in simple terms, right? So therefore, the one thing that these developers want is a pipeline of land that A, gets planning permission and B, gets sanitary services, wastewater treatment and gets electricity. And you know what? They'll make somewhere between 15 and 40 percent. And that's why Glenvey have three factories building, hopefully, a house an hour in terms of... Why would they hoard land when the one thing they want is to get more planning permissions and development? So the notion of actually people land hoarding is bullshit from the get-go. And it, so if you go through the Land Development Agency and see, OK, what are your plans? Remember John Moran back in the day we interviewed him on The Tonight Show? He was the first chairman of this. The idea was you get state land. And to this day, whether it's a site in Colbert uh, area in, in Limerick City near the, near or the whatever, station, yeah. the difference between the 14,000 units they're going to build and the 79,000 they should be building is because state organisations will not release it. This tax was a nonsense from the get-go. It was misconceived. And it's people like Rory Ahern and Rory, Sinn Féin Rory Hearn. Hearn and all these experts <laughs> who academia have decided, uh, you know, this is the problem. It's not the problem. And if you talk to people, anyone, they want, they want if they own land, but the problem is a lot of the land they bought, they can't get zoned. So this is a nonsense. Not only should it be reformed from the point of view of, 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 of farmers, it should be scrapped. Well, a couple of things on that. One, I have argued on this podcast before that we have a major issue in relation to state hoarding of land. The Land Development Agency had a report that came out last year which showed how it was being hobbled effectively and what it wanted to do. I've also pointed out the lack of ambition. Is this in Who Owns Ireland, the book, the famous book? Who Really Owns Ireland? (laughs) Thank thank you for mentioning that. Um, But uh, John Coleman, the LDA, has has ambitions, but he has been restricted in what he's been able to do. John Moran 
has pointed out that, for example, what he wanted to do in Colbert, which you've just mentioned, yeah, Limerick. The, the state just scaled back enormously yeah. on the ambition that he had for it. That's one of the reasons he gave up the chair of the LDA was his frustration in relation to that. But what I am interested in is how this has again affected relationships between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil on one side and the Greens. So it's various Greens are well, out. Don't let, the, let, don't, don't let the, do- the door hit your arse on the way out. Like that's the situation there. And that's the point at <laughs> which we'll finish. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Don't forget, if you want to go to ticketmaster.ie, tickets for the Olympia Theatre live show on Wednesday, September 11th. And you can also go to the Cork Opera House website for tickets as part of the Cork Podcast Festival. We're in Cork on Friday the 13th of September. And we'll be back here again next week with another edition of Path to Power. On those gigs, uh, it's even been suggested that after they're over, if people want to meet me or to a lesser extent you, in the, the bar. Ego, the ego, the ego. If that people will be available. No, I, I, I'm there for a meet and greet <laughs> and a selfie and everything else you might want. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan. <laughs> right, until the next time.